My name is Alan Price, and I am the director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and it is great to have you here. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching this evening's program online, as well as those of you who braved traffic to be with us in person today. I'd, uh, if you have suggestions or or any feedback, we've switched the rooms, and this was an intentional experiment to hold a more intimate conversation about this particular book. So if you have feedback on this and you wanna pass it on to our fabulous Liz Murphy, who is our forum's producer, uh, let her know, because oftentimes you'll see us in Smith Hall. It's just, it's not the kind of intimate space to have this conversation. So I thought this is the right location for this one. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters for the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and CVS Health, as well as the Mass Cultural Council and our media sponsor, the Boston Globe. Welcome, come on down, not to worry. Uh, I'd also like to open with a land acknowledgement to recognize that the land on which we stand and sit was once stewarded by indigenous people. While a land acknowledgement is not enough by itself, it is an important way to promote indigenous visibility and it serves as a reminder that we are on stolen and settled indigenous lands. And I invite all of us to contemplate how to better support indigenous communities and learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. I'd like to thank you in advance for taking a moment to silence or turn off your cell phones. We've already heard a number of them go off and it disrupts the broadcast and conversation. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening and you'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. And when the Q&A begins, we will invite those of you who are joining us in person to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. Jeffrey Rosen has kindly agreed to sign copies of his book after tonight's program. Our bookstore has copies available if you are interested. As we approach the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, we are so pleased to have this opportunity to reflect on what the pursuit of happiness meant to our nation's founders and what that meant for the founding of our democracy with our distinguished guest this evening. I'm now delighted to welcome Jeffrey Rosen to the library this evening. He is president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, where he hosts We the People, a weekly podcast of constitutional debate. He is also a professor of law at the George Washington University Law School and a contributing editor at The Atlantic. He is the author of seven previous books, including the New York Times bestseller, Conversations with RBG, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on Life, Love, Liberty, and Law. His essays and commentaries have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, on NPR, The New Republic, where he was the legal affairs editor, and in The New Yorker, where he has been a staff writer. His new book is The Pursuit of Happiness, How Classical Writers on Virtue Inspired the Lives of the Founders and Defined America. And I have to commend you for an extraordinary book. It has been a great many years since I read Plato's Phaedrus, and at the time, I might have been a bit too young to fully understand and how to connect the dots uh, between Plato and the ideals of the nation's founders. Uh, Jeffrey connects those dots with illustrative simplicity. And many of you in the audience are familiar with this quote from President Kennedy. The ancient Greek definition of happiness was full use of your powers along lines of excellence. Jeffrey Rosen, like President Kennedy, reminds us that if we're going to pursue happiness, we should spend some time reflecting on the definition of happiness. It is also a pleasure to welcome Mary Sarah Builder back to the library this evening. 
She is the founding, the founder's professor of law at the Boston College Law School, where she teaches in the areas of property, trusts and estates, and American legal and constitutional history. The author of three books, including most recently, Female Genius, Eliza Harriet and George Washington at the Dawn of the Constitution. She was awarded the 2016 Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy for her book, Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention. The author of numerous articles and a frequent speaker and commentator, she has also served as a legal history consultant to Steven Spielberg on Amistad. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. A special thanks to any of you who are members, and if you are online and you want to join as a member, you can find the link on the webpage. So, um, welcome tonight, and uh, thank everyone to coming, and thanks, Jeff, for joining us tonight to talk about this absolutely terrific book. I enjoyed every moment of reading it, and I really encourage people um, to buy it. And what I actually say I have to really love about it and for the audience, it's exceptionally readable. Um, people might think that because it says classical writers and founders that it wouldn't be a super interesting jolly book, uh, but it's a super interesting book. It's um, you can read it one chapter every night. So that would be, I think, in keeping with one of the things we're going to talk about, um, having a routine. And I learned an enormous amount from reading the book. And actually, it was one of those assignments that I enjoyed thoroughly. And so maybe you can just start us tonight by telling us a little bit about the book, and, and then we'll talk from there. Wonderful. Well, first of all, it is so great to be here in Boston uh, with you, Mary. I've just admired and learned from your work so much, and your amazing book, Madison's Hand, is just definitive, so everyone should check that out as well. And Alan, what a great quotation from President Kennedy. That sums up the classical definition of the pursuit of happiness, the full use of your talents in accordance with excellence. And uh, that meant that for the classical philosophers and for the founders, happiness was not feeling good, but being good. It was not the pursuit of pleasure, but the pursuit of virtue. And the pursuit of virtue, as President Kennedy said, has to do with self-mastery, self-reliance, improving your character so that you can make the best use of your talents in accordance with excellence. The definition comes most famously from Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, where he defines happiness as an activity of the soul in conformity with virtue or excellence. But because excellence and virtue aren't self-defining, you really need that idea that President Kennedy captured of developing your talents, cultivating your faculties, to use Jefferson's words. And that gets us to the fact that uh, the, the classical people thought we have certain faculties reason in the head, passion in the heart, desire in the stomach. And Pythagoras, who turns out to be the great founder of moral philosophy in addition to inventing the triangle and the harmonic system, it was he who came up with the idea that we should use our powers of reason to moderate or master our unreasonable passions and emotions so we achieve the calm tranquility and self-mastery that defines happiness. Just qu quickly about how I was given this amazing project, which changed my life. It changed my understanding of happiness and how to be a good person and a good citizen. And it was just a series of unusual synchronicities that led me to it. It was during COVID. I saw that Benjamin Franklin, who I knew had made a list of 13 virtues to achieve moral perfection. I knew about this Franklin 13 virtue system because I practiced it a couple of years ago at the recommendation of a local rabbi who recommended that a friend and I try the Hebrew version, it was translated into Hebrew in the 18th century and a friend and I tried it and every night you have to make a list of the virtues, temperance, prudence, uh, order, and when you've fallen short, you put an X mark. We tried it for a while, it's an incredibly depressing system because there are all these <laughs> X marks. And Franklin had exactly the same experience. He tried it for a while, he had X marks every night, it was incredibly depressing and he gave up. But like Franklin, we thought we were better for having tried. It was a useful project of self-accounting. 
okay, so I knew the Franklin system, but I noticed during COVID, he chose as his motto a quotation that said, without virtue, happiness cannot be. And it was from this book by Cicero I'd never heard of called The Tusculan Disputations. Then a few weeks later, I was at the Boar's Head Inn in Charlottesville, Virginia, and on the wall, this is on the UVA campus, was a list of 12 virtues that Jefferson had made for his granddaughters. And they looked almost exactly like Franklin's virtues, temperance, prudence, uh, Jefferson left off chastity, appropriately <laughs> enough given both of their shameful uh, records there. But Jefferson also, and this was the clincher, chose as his motto a passage that he would send to anyone who asked him the meaning of happiness when he was old. And it was from Cicero, and it was a little longer. It said, he who has achieved a tranquility of soul, neither uh, exalted by wanton exaltation or despondent by undue depression, he is the wise man of whom we're in quest. He's the tranquil man. I thought, I've got to read this Cicero, because uh, it was so important to Franklin and Jefferson. What else to read? Then I found Thomas Jefferson's reading list. And when he was old and people would, you know, their kids are going to law school and they say, what should, what should we read to be an educated person? He would send this reading list. It has, it's incredibly rigorous. You have to get up before sunrise. You have to read political philosophy and government in the morning. You're allowed some history in the mid-afternoon literature by the evening, sort of 12 hours a day of reading. And then you start again the next day. But in the section on ethics or natural religion, I saw the Cicero book along with other books of moral philosophy that I'd never read before. Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and some enlightenment thinkers like Lord Bolingbroke and Hume and Lord Keynes. Um, back in Boston, uh, I, I went to college here in the 80s. Um, and when I, I was had the most marvelous teachers at Harvard, I studied Puritan theology with Sack Van Berkovich, history with <laughs> Uh, well, I, was, I should have laughed too when I read <laughs> about the Puritan theology. You know Saki? Oh, blessed be his memory. Just this marvelous, transformative um, teacher of Puritanism. I'll share my, my story with him. So I'm studying Puritan with, Puritanism with the great scholar of our time, and I'm totally unconvinced by Puritan theology because Puritan theology says um, you're predestined randomly at birth by God to hell or heaven, nothing you do during your life, no amounts of good works or even faith can determine your salvation. But you might as well try to be a good person because good works follow, they don't precede justification. So if you act well, it might be reassuring evidence that maybe you've been you know, chosen to the right place, but you can't count on it. And this just wasn't doing it for me. Plus, I'm Jewish, so. <laughs> but I was yearning for the example of how do you lead a good life? And there was one moment in class where Sack Van Berkovich said, he was reading the part about where, where Jesus says to his disciples, be perfect, even as you know, God is perfect. And S S Professor Berkovich said, wouldn't it be, no, I shouldn't say this. All right, wouldn't, isn't it true that we should try to be as perfect as Jesus, he said? And it was this radical, challenge in a secular age. And I thought, well, how, what's the, why should we achieve perfection? Or how do you achieve a purpose-driven life by reason and reflection, not by blind faith or religious authority? And what I didn't realize, because despite this marvelous education with these wonderful teachers, these books of classical moral philosophy had just fallen out of the curriculum by the time I was in college. And what just is stunning is this was central to the a uh, core curriculum, not only of college kids at great universities, like I was privileged enough to attend, but middle school, high school, law students. It was in McGuffey readers. It was taught to Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass on the frontier. This is central to what it meant to be an educated person or just to, be, to go to school for most of American history. And it just fell out of the curriculum. So I'll, I'll, I'll end by saying, I, I just, I feel like this is, I'm coming back to Boston. It's Weirdly, when I was in college, I was reading all this Puritan theology, and I thought, I would love to write a book called Good and Evil, an update. What is a moral framework? That was the title. But I had nothing to say at the time, because I didn't know what the update was. And I learned that the update, there's no need for an update, because the, the wisdom was there, just waiting to be rediscovered. So we'll, un we'll unpack all of that. Let's just begin by, I mean, I love this idea that during COVID, when other people were baking bread or taking care of their kids, you decided, I checked, I checked it out somewhere, right? I went to the library. I was inspired to check out Plutarch's Lives, 
this is very small print. Um, you read your way through a lot of these kinds of books. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because one of the things that's very interesting about this book and, and is why it's kind of a good read is um, you decided to take notes by writing sonnets. And there's a sonnet that Jeff wrote for every one of the chapters. Um, and that's not the way that everybody would go about <laughs> <laughs> like deciding to read these books and that. So just tell us a little bit about that. Look, the whole project was extremely weird. I recognize <laughs> that. I don't know where it came from. It was COVID. We had time on our hands. I think it was Jefferson, definitely, who inspired me to get up before sunrise, which I hadn't done, nor have I done this kind of deep reading since college. I'd just fallen out of the habit. Um, but there's something about the discipline of getting up, doing the reading, watching the sunrise. And the sunrise is the most beautiful thing imaginable. It's so gorgeous. And every day you can kind of look forward to reading the sun And then sort of I felt moved to just kind of sum up the wisdom in some kind of classical, symmetrical, harmonious form. Because a friend of mine who runs the Globe Shakespeare Theater in San Diego posted a YouTube video, How to Write a Shakespearean Sonnet. And it's, you know, the meter is easy, but then it's supposed to have a volta or turn in the third stanza. I thought that, anyway, that was just kind of, I was moved to do it. But then I learned that all sorts of people who read this stuff uh, for, for, for a long time were also moved to write sonnets. Phyllis Wheatley, the great black poet, Alexander Hamilton, Mercy Otis Warren, but John Quincy Adams would wake up in the White House, read Cicero in the original, write sonnets, which are really good, and then watch the sunrise and walk along the Potomac. So there's something in the air about that. But the, the really transformative thing, and this is the takeaway, if I can, if there, you know, be, be, if I can share it, it just blows my mind that all the books were free and online. They're just, my, my folks had that Plutarch edition, which was in their library, and I actually have it. I never read it as a kid. It's long, and as you say, the type is small. Now, the Addison original uh, translation, there are these Delphi editions of out-of-print books for $1.99, whatever you want, the complete works of anyone. And when I was a kid, I went to the Library of Congress with my mom, and I was so filled with wonder at the thought that all the books in the world were in that beautiful building, the Thomas Jefferson Building, Rebecca's nodding. I think it's the most beautiful building in DC. And I, it, uh, but now I could just read all this stuff sitting on my couch. And all I needed was the self-discipline to read it. And it, I think it was just the habit of getting up and having to do my reading before I was allowed to browse that did the whole thing. So I created a rule for myself. You know, I woke up, and of course, I was tempted to browse or check email. And I wasn't allowed to do that until I'd done my reading. And that daily habit just changed everything. And now I've gotten into the habit of reading in the morning, and I'm writing another book, and I'm reading and writing sonnets, and actually writing songs now, because you just set aside the time in the morning, and it's just like creative time where you're not allowed to browse. And that's kind of it. It's just a sort of life hack. But this was the core of the Pythagorean wisdom, too. And it also comes from Franklin, that virtue is about habits, just daily habits. It's about daily practice. You're, we all fall short, of course. But by trying daily, you can become a little more perfect. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, if I had been really clever, I would have written a sonnet to read to you <laughs> after reading the book, you know? like I, I had a great conversation with Jeff Goldberg from The Atlantic. We launched the book in Philly, and he asked, Chat GPT to write sonnets. Oh, to write in my a sonnet. Yeah. Thing, it yeah, sounded like me, and they're much better than mine, and I'm out of business of sonnets because yeah, yeah, yeah. Chat yeah. GPT. I won. actually enjoyed the sonnets a lot, um, <laughs> and it's the only book I know about the founders that includes poetry written by the author. So that's like definitely a prize-winning aspect of the book itself. You can one of the things that I really loved at the beginning of the book, uh, and also found a little bit intimidating, was this sense of the number of them that had these kinds of efforts at discipline or of order of their day. And, um, and you talked a little bit about how you've managed to keep it. I actually have to say, I found it slightly um, depressing. I figured I could only do it for one or two days. And how long were you able to, maybe you can tell the audience, because it's super interesting, Franklin tries it. Everybody comes up with this idea that they divide their day up, and they make this list, and they aspire. And then um, you know, what, how, how many of them do you think did it for very long? Well, Adams and Jefferson are doing it until the end of their lives. I mean, that's the most beautiful thing, despite all of their, I mean, they fought the revolution, they fell out in the bloodiest political battle ever, they reconciled through Abigail. And what do they want to do with their writing? 
talk about the books they're reading. And it's so exciting. Just Adams is so excited to learn that Pythagoras might have traveled to the East and read the Hindu Vedas. And then Adams, with this brilliant, synthetic, uh, eclectic uh, impulse, synthesizes the teaching of the Eastern and Western wisdom traditions into the idea, love God and all his creatures, rejoice in all things which sounds a lot like Gandhi's renounce and enjoy. And Adams notes the connection between the Gita and the um, ancient wisdom in the same way that Emerson would later do. And he was so influenced by the Bhagavad Gita. So I, I think the reason there's still, and, and Jefferson diligently responds to almost every letter that he gets and notes the number of letters he's responded to. And Adams says, oh, you're lapping me. I've only done you know a quarter of that. But it's the youthful, habits. They, they, were, they fell short of their ideals in so many ways, but they kept up their reading and writing until the end. I love that Jefferson letter, that Jefferson letter, which I teach my students, and we all decide, would we want to have done Jefferson's version of law school reading or ours? And in that letter, Jefferson says, in the summer, it's really great because you have extra time. And then he says, so you can read even longer <laughs> rather than, I'm thinking like mostly other people, normal people would go outside and enjoy the sun rather than that. But this is the ancient teaching. Um, Brandeis, who's another, he was both a Jeffersonian and a great classicist, was so excited to learn that the Greek word for leisure is unemployment <laughs> or a scoli. He said, what a happy land that. Because for Brandeis, leisure is a time not so you can work less but more working on cultivating your faculties of reason, of deep reading and writing so that you can be your best self, to use the modern phrase. And there's something, the other thing is, it, examples are really inspiring. I read Jefferson and also Brandeis, and you kind of want to be with like them. Yeah, so mate, one of the things that I loved about this book was you take this ha set of habits that they have, the order they have, the desire they have to be better people. And one of the things that I think is very provocative about the book is you sort of compare it to the way that now people want to um, practice mindfulness or they have therapists. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what inside all of these guys' brains drew them to desire some understanding of the good life. Well, they're just getting hit over the head with it by their parents and their youthful reading. I mean, think of John Quincy Adams, who for me is the most virtuous of the bunch, but he's also beating himself up the most. I thought having a Jewish mom was could be challenging. Imagine having a Puritan mom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and Abigail is just always kind of after him, like you must use your powers of reason to tame your unreasonable passions. There are women in the streets of Paris, you know, you have to, temptation is lurking in every corner. She loves to quote the proverb, he who's, who's uh, slow to anger is greater than he who's conquered a village. And, and John is telling him the same thing and exhorting that he reads Cicero, and there's that amazing letter when he's something like 27, he's just turned down an appointment to the US Supreme Court that he's been unanimously confirmed to. He's ambassador to Russia and he doesn't wanna leave. And he said, I'm 27 years old, I haven't accomplished anything, I'm wasting my life, I'm wasting my talents, I'm going to the theater too much and drinking too much and getting fat, I've gotta, if only I could buckle down and be industrious, I might make something of myself. So part of it is, is their parents. And then it's the reading. And that's, I had the same reaction when you read this wisdom. And what's very important to emphasize is this isn't just the Greek and Roman classics. That, that's just one of the moral philosophy that the founders read. There's also the Bible. There's also the Christian uh, divines like Willitson and Tolitson who are trying to reconcile Christianity and reason. Blackstone's commentaries, the Whig writers, Cato's letters, all of them have the same lesson about the need to achieve self-mastery on a personal level so that you can achieve self-government on a political level. So I think it just completely defined their moral universe and they couldn't help but think of it all the time. Yeah, I mean, I thought the, the notion that, um, that, that you really emphasize in the book that the idea of happiness that we have, which is sort of happiness to go do whatever you want, is very different from their idea of happiness. And that's a big emphasis in the book, is that we sort of misunderstand what happiness, for example, in the Declaration of Independence means. I mean, it's, it's the, the opposite. When I was studying the Puritans and being unsatisfied, it was the 80s, it was the greed is good decade, and just all the things that were celebrated by pop culture, like greed is good, or you do you, or whatever, the me decade, 
is the opposite of what the classical wisdom is. Now, as you said, modern mindfulness uh, teaching is, is the classical wisdom. And I was so struck, I, I mentioned that my dad died at 95 just as I was finishing the book. He was a great hypnotherapist of the 20th century. And I learned after finishing it that his wisdom about hypnosis embodied in a quotation from Paracelsus, as we imagine ourselves to be, so shall we be, and we are what we imagine. The incredible power of the imagination to transform reality is the same as the Eastern traditions. We are what we think, life shaped by the mind, and uh, the, the emphasis on controlling the only thing you can control, which is your own thoughts and emotions and not the actions of others, which is the Stoic and Hindu wisdom. For me, it was really just a change in perspective. When I tried to disaggregate the virtues and how did I do on prudence today or temperance, it's, it's a mess because you, you fall short on the individual stuff. But when you realize that the quest and the goal is a kind of calm tranquility and avoiding unproductive emotions like anger, jealousy, and fear, which is what Justice Ginsburg's mom told her to avoid, so that you can achieve the focus and self-mastery that allows you to do your best, to use your talents to the best of your ability, that I could practice that because it's a kind of a holistic state rather than uh, any kind of uh, anything more particular. And, and it was really striking to see how often the founders talk about that tranquility, moderation, the moderate virtues as both a psychological state they're trying to achieve and also a political state. Well, one of the things I love about the book, and I, and I wrote it down so I would have it, is um, Jeff has this list of the virtues, and then he has them lined up with the founders. So I'll just read them. Uh, order, that's where you tell us these slightly intimidating efforts to like organize your whole life. But then we have temperance with Ben Franklin, humility with John Adams, industry, Thomas Jefferson, frugality, James Wilson and George Mason, sincerity, uh, Phyllis Wheatley and the enslavers, Ar avarice, resolution, George Washington, moderation, Madison and Hamilton, tranquility, Adams and Jefferson, cleanliness, cleanliness, John Quincy Adams, Justice Frederick Douglass and Lincoln, and then silence today, and we'll get to that one. But. Um, Let's, let's ask you the question that you say. Jefferson left chastity off. Um, most people try and put sex in their book. Why did huh. you decide, <laughs> like, the one moment you had, I'll have a <laughs> whole chapter on chastity, and none of these guys really followed it. So, but what, what, why did chastity not make the list here? You know, I think I thought 13 chapters would be too long. <laughs> <Basically>, <laughs> a I had to on. kill one of them, and, like it. and it seemed like the least yeah. of the... Your publisher's it, representative's here, and she's yeah. like, Jeff, next book, don't <laughs> lie. <laughs> you know? I, I, it, it, it also, it, Franklin kind of puts it on in a half-hearted way. His, he has little slogans for each of them, and it's use venery, but rarely, and in marriage, or something like that. Um, it, it, it wasn't something that, uh, but in any event, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it's very good advice and we should all try to practice it, of course. Yeah. How did you decide who went with which chapter? It was, you know, uh, I hope, a useful but loose construct. P different people could go with other ones, but uh, humility had to be Adams just because he had so much trouble practicing it. Yeah, I liked, I liked, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and then maybe we can talk about that because one of the things that I think is interesting about what you point out about the classical writers and about how people interpreted them was that, um, that, that what they found appealing about this idea wasn't that it promised that human beings were, were perfect or good, but they instead thought human beings struggled immensely. And so you needed these kinds of virtues. You need to be reminded of these examples in order to sort of help you deal with the inner self, the struggle. And, and so a lot of these chapters talk about um, not how somebody achieved perfection with that virtue, but how they struggled with that virtue. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the struggles. And Adams would be a great struggle. We're in Massachusetts um, uh, with John Adams. We, we know from lots of um, Broadway shows, two different Broadway shows that include John Adams, that, um, that humility wasn't his strongest suit. And, and yet you're also sympathetic to his struggle over humility. He's so endearing. He's so relatable. He's, he, he is full of pride and ego. He's mocked in his time for his self-regard. He wants the presidency to be called his elective majesty. He's, he's made fun of as his rotundity. He's constantly 
as you've written so well, um, raging against people for not giving him the credit for the American Revolution. He talks about himself in the third person. You know, Adams really wrote the Declaration. Adams <laughs> deserves all the credit. And yet, he knows it. And the beautiful stories of his fallings out and reconciliations with Jefferson and the great Mer Mercy Otis Warren, which is another marvelous Massachusetts story, are so powerful. Mercy Otis Warren, first of all, is another example of how women at, at the time, including Abigail, were not allowed to uh, go to Harvard, which the guys were, uh, but those who were got classical educations were as brilliant as the guys. And Mercy was educated with James Otis. She insisted on taking lessons with him in the classics, and she writes these spectacular poems and satires on the revolution, which Adams acclaims, he calls her the genius of the revolution, and she writes the adulator and, and other great poems. They then fall out uh, over politics. Her history of the US uh, accuses him of being a monarchist, which was the standard Jeffersonian charge against a Adams and Hamilton, but he rages and says it's unfair and he's not a monarchist. And they have a, a terrible falling out, but then Abigail sends a lock of her hair to Mercy and they reconcile and apologize and Adams then has the humility to reacclaim her poetical genius and she says, I've just got one favor to ask you. I just went to the Boston Athenaeum and someone's taking credit for my play, The Adjulator. Some guy put his name on the title page. You're the only one who knows I wrote it. Can you certify that? Gets on a horse, rides into Boston, goes to the Athenaeum, writes on the title page. This was written by Mercy Otis Warren. It's just, just marvelous. So he, he, uh, he, he, um, he, he's self-aware and in the end, he mastered his temper and his vanity and sustained his friendships. Yeah, and that's and that's and they die on the same day. Oh, as Jefferson. I mean, yeah, you can't. You know, it's it, that was. Everyone thinks it's divine providence, and maybe it was. Yeah, yeah. Madison. They wanted him to die on the same day, and he refused to take opioids to oh. to live long enough to die on the same day as uh, Adams and Jefferson. Um, and so, yeah, it's sort of interesting. Uh, good plot for a, for a movie. Oh, Talk yeah. about um, another person that you wrestle with the degree to which I think their, the virtue you've assigned them matches up. Um, you give industry to Jefferson, and, yet, and he was industrious in all sorts of ways, and yet you repeatedly point out that um, that was also the product of the fact that he was an enslaver, he owned people, he never w was willing to basically say that slavery was a bad, to free himself from it. So maybe you can talk about um, the, the way Jefferson complicates, again, the, the virtue of industry. J Jefferson's uh, doesn't bear close examination, and in many ways he's even worse on slavery, the, the harder you look. It was striking for me to realize how none of the enslavers from Virginia justified slavery at that time. Jefferson and the others all said it was a violation of the natural rights declared to be self-evident in the Declaration. There's that really striking quotation from Patrick Henry where he says, is it not amazing that I myself who thinks slavery violates natural law myself own slaves? I will not justify it, I won't attempt to. It's simple avarice I can't do with the inconvenience of living without them. And that moment of self-awareness, yes, it's wrong, but I just like the lifestyle, summed it up. And, and Jefferson said a version of the same thing. Usually he'd accuse others of avarice. He kept saying that South Carolina and Georgia were avaricious for not giving up the international slave trade while Virginia was willing to give it up. But just, I mean, the extraordinary lack of self-awareness and capacity for self-denial of a Jefferson who exalts industry as telling his daughters to you know, do their reading and yet surrounds himself at Monticello that this fantasy of a Palladian villa or a sort of Roman virtue, um, which he only achieves by living wildly beyond his means and relying on enslaved labor. And the enslaved labor are his own kids. And he doesn't free them until his death, keeping a promise to Sally Hemings uh, and doesn't free anyone else. And in the end, the whole thing has to be sold anyway, because despite having inveiled against debt for his whole life and saying no generation can bind another with debt and saying every constitution has to be reconceived every 19 years because the living can't bind the dead, Monticello has to be sold anyway uh, to, to pay his debts. 
So um, it's, it doesn't in any way excuse it. In fact, it may implicate him more. But it's striking that he saw it in classical terms, as they all did, as a form of avarice or greed. Yeah, and you tell the story in a, in a beautiful chapter here uh, that you label sincerity, uh, where you really, I think, tackle in a very upfront way the gap between what some of them wrote about enslavement and slavery and race and the way that they themselves practiced it in their lifetime. And um, that's a beautiful chapter on Phyllis Wheatley, who again, um, Massachusetts. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit about Phyllis Wheatley. She's come back in. There's a number of great books about her and exhibits. Um, but I think you do a lovely job thinking about here the tension between them. And Jefferson was not great in Washington actually recognized Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, Jefferson, not so good. It's such another inspiring Massachusetts story. It's so wonderful to be in Massachusetts, <laughs> here, yeah. where it all came from. And, and what a story. She comes over in chains. And she is taken by her master the, the, and mistress, the Wheatleys, who decide, for reasons not entirely clear, to give her a classical education with their kids. And she reads uh, Cicero and, and Seneca and the classics, and she becomes the greatest poet of her age. Uh, an international celebrity, as, as Professor Gates put it in his great book on the trial of Phyllis Wheatley, the Oprah Winfrey of her day. But first she has to overcome the racist view in Boston that did she really write her own poems? So the city holds a trial, or at least an examination, presided over by none other than John Hancock. And he and the Mathers and all the Boston worthies examine her poems and somehow examine her. Uh, and. They, concede, they conclude that she did indeed write her own poems, they certify it, and she goes off to London, and she meets the Dukes, and she is acclaimed by all, uh, and then eventually she agrees to come back only on the condition that she be given her freedom, because Lord, the Somerset uh, decision has just come down, and had she stayed in England, she could have been freed, but apparently in exchange for a promise that she'll be freed, she comes back. And, and she, as you said, she sends her poem to George Washington, and he acclaims her genius. He calls her a, a poetical genius and thanks her very sincerely and treats her with respect. But Jefferson has a very different reaction. And it's just shocking that in the notes on the state of Virginia, he goes on this rant against Phyllis Wheatley. And he says, her poems are beneath contempt because black people are intellectually inferior, basically. He says, I, this is only a suspicion. He'd like to be proved wrong. But he, he uh, says that unlike enslaved uh, people in Rome where slaves were white, black people in America can't be good poets because they're black. It's just shocking and a sign of the fact that he was really racist. Yeah, and her poems are brilliant. Oh. Absolutely brilliant and uh, incredible, particularly on the topic of the book where so many classical allusions often cleverly playing with the idea of liberty in the Roman sense versus herself as a black poet. So um, uh, it's a, just you do a beautiful job of that. Let's talk about one more person who's in the book from Massachusetts, John Quincy Adams, oh. who I have a sense is your sort of hero, maybe your fave man in this. Um, and I just have to start by, um, there's, well, we're going to get to what this says about government, because that's a big theme of the book. But, um, but there's a beautiful story you tell here where um, uh, he loses. And he spends the next year reading Cicero in Latin. And I'm just learning Latin, so I'm incredibly impressed um, on doing that. But not all, not all presidents, when they lose, read Cicero <laughs> in Latin. <laughs> well, not all uh, presidents are just so mindful about their self-mastery quest, nor as devastated as he was by his presidential loss, because his son had just committed suicide. And because George Washington Adams, burdened with this impossible name, uh, couldn't take the pressure of being an Adams. And John Quincy Adams had written these letters to his son from a Christian, where based on Quincy's close reading of the Bible, he's exhorting his son to do good and be perfect. And it's just too much. And, and George Washington Adams becomes an alcoholic and jumps off a steamship. And Adams is just crushed. And he walks around Harvard Square with his wife, Louisa, and they see a rainbow, which is a ground for hope. And then he's lost the presidency, and his whole world has fallen out of him. So what does he do? He, he, re he reads Cicero, which he's read before with his dad, but he rereads it in the original. And he's drawn, in particular, to the Tusculan Disputations, the book that inspired Jefferson and Franklin. And he chooses as his motto from the Tusculan Disputations a line that says, I plant for the benefit of future generations, 
my seeds will only bear fruit in the future. That, as it happens, was the, is the motto of Adam's house, my undergraduate dorm. And I didn't know what it meant or anything <laughs> of the, the kind. But that's how, I mean, it's just the synchronicity of it all coming back to that. All comes back to the Tusculan disputations and all to that line that we don't labor with expectations about the immediate fruits of our actions. We can't control those things. We just do our best to the best of our abilities in the hope that they'll perhaps bear fruit in the future. So Adams is, is I, I, he is my favorite, if I, I suppose, because he's so, he grows. He learns and grows so significantly. He's such a, he's so diligent and earnest and he's commuting between Washington and Boston while he's in the, uh, while he's in Washington as the first Boylston professor of rhetoric at Harvard where he writes this collection of essays about Cicero's oratory that John sends to Thomas Jefferson as the peace offering that restores their friendship. But what's so moving about John Quincy Adams is after having gone through this, the trials of self-mastery and being president and losing and losing his son, he then transforms himself into the greatest abolitionist of his age. And it's based partly on his reading of Cicero and partly of the Bible and based on his own close reading, which I haven't seen anyone else come up with, a passage which says that Jesus shall give freedom to all the captives, uh, as well as a prophecy from Isaiah. He thinks all the captives means the slaves and that slavery is prophesied to uh, end with divine dis uh, sanction of its eradication. So based on that, he denounces the gag rule, which forbids the introduction of abolitionist um, petitions. He comes up with the original reading of the Declaration, which Lincoln later channels, that says that it forbids uh, slavery. Uh, and he insists on the power to forbid the expansion of slavery in the Missouri Compromise. And he introduces a constitutional amendment to end slavery. And then he just has the most astonishingly dramatic and uh, moving end where he casts a vote against the Mexican War and then collapses on a sofa in the house where he's serving. And his last words are, I am composed. And it's a quotation from Cicero. The perfectly self-composed man has achieved the tranquility of soul that the Tusculan Disputation says is the essence of happiness. I mean, it's, um, uh, and he is the only president to go back into Congress, right? In, in, into the House, and, and just with great humility, the whole party system is up for grabs. The, his Fed, Republican Party has collapsed. The Federalists are gone. He reinvents himself as a Whig. And Frederick Douglass acclaims him as the greatest American president, the model of self-reliance, and the greatest friend of abolitionism. And it is his arguments against secession and about the indissolubility of the Union that Daniel Webster relies on to oppose uh, secession, uh, as channeled by John Calhoun and Jefferson. Uh, he's the great nationalist. He's just incredibly significant. I mean, one of the parts of the book that you, I think, do a beautiful job with is where you emphasize this, that what they took from classical writers wasn't just the idea of living their own lives in this way, but this is what they thought um, people in government ought to do, that, that the American system of government uh, was built on the idea that people and the government were going to follow these ideas. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, how does this, this idea of diligence, moderation, reason play into their understanding of how the government's going to work? Well, let, let's talk about it in connection with Madison. And I love your thoughts because you're the world expert. Madison is getting it at Princeton. Uh, and it's called, and he, he uniquely applies faculty psychology from personal self-government to political self-government. Uh, he's not the only one who does that, but he more mind mindfully than the others says that just as Plato found reason, passion, and desire in the head, heart, and stomach, so we can find a similar mirroring of the faculties in the constitution of the state and the president, senate, and house, and judiciary can mirror the faculties and checks and balances through the theory of the counteracting passions, which is Hamilton's phrase, can ensure that ambition is used to counteract ambition. We don't 
assume men are angels, because uh, then uh, government uh, wouldn't be necessary, but you need some virtue or else government wouldn't be possible. So Madison designs the whole system to slow down deliberation so that factions or mobs can't form factions or groups animated by passion rather than reason, devoted to self-interest rather than the public good. They've seen Greece and Rome fall. Madison's read the trunk full of books from Jefferson sent over from Paris that say that classical republics, when they're democracies, fall to demagogues in all large assemblies of any character composed. Passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. He says in Federalist 55, even if every Athenian were Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. So the constitution prevents mobs from forming because it's a really big country. By the time mobs find each other, they'll get tired or go home. Plus, Madison is optimistic about this new media technology, the broadside press, that will allow people to put complicated arguments like the Federalist Papers in the newspapers. They'll slowly diffuse across the land. People will discuss them in coffee houses and talk about it with their representatives who will slowly go back to Washington and reason uh, diffused by this class of journalists he calls the literati will ensure that we have a republic of reason. So, uh, f f f um, you know, the, of, of course the age of X and whatever it's called, Instagram and Twitter looks very different. But was that, um, how, how creative was Madison in making that leap that the, the classical version was virtue was especially necessary in a republic, um, oligarchy, oligarchies or aristocracies are ruled by honor, monarchies by fear, and republics by virtue. But Madison is mixing in the French physiocrats with this new theory of public opinion to say that citizens have to be self-mastered and not tweet too much if you're gonna have a successful republic. How, how creative was he? Yeah, see, this that? is usually I'm in that seat and Jeff's in this seat. <laughs> and then no matter what book I write, Jeff's like, let's talk about Madison. Well, you well, you, like, always, oh, you yeah. know, and I always yeah. learn from you on yeah. this. But. No, I mean, I love this idea that I think your book really emphasizes, which is something that I think um, isn't as obvious in the, in the 21st century as it would have been to earlier people, that the system is, is based on an assumption about human behavior, which is that human behavior um, it struggles with ambition, it struggles with avarice, and so you kind of, at the end of the day, hope people or require people or try and lead people to behave well, and therefore the system also has to be filled with checks and balances and separations because that's the only way you can also reinforce that. But I have to read a quote. Um, you have a quote in here uh, that says, Adams wrote that he agreed with Sir Edward Cook that only sad men were fit to be legislators. Aged men who'd been tossed and buffeted in the vicissitudes of life, forced upon profound reflections by grief and disappointment, and taught to command their passions and prejudices, mm. and it's a it's a beautiful um, quote, um, but but complicated quote for here in this building where we have a very young president, mm. and we know we have um, uh, uh, older people running for office right now, and so mm. maybe you can talk a little bit about um, about how they thought about age, how they thought mm. what what age brought to government, what people learned over their lifetime. What a great question. I mean, it's really significant, isn't it, that the Tusculan Disputations, which is all of their favorite manual about happiness, is an essay on grief. And Cicero writes it when he's lost his daughter, Tulia, and is trying to console himself by retiring to his Tusculan villa. And grief is something that comes with age, and that's why Adams thought that sad men should be legislators. And it's why the Talmud says that only aged judges can sit on death penalty cases because they alone will have known the joys and travails of raising kids. And you have to have been seasoned by age in order to have the wisdom necessary for all of these virtues, moderation, tranquil, uh, tr you know, tranquility, sincerity, all the self-mastery is a quest, as you said, it's a struggle. That's why all the sources use the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. It's not something to be obtained, it's something that you daily struggle for, and only later in life do you find the pursuit. I should say, by the way, it was so exciting to, because all the sources are online, just to do word searches and see all of them contain the phrase, the pursuit of happiness. It wasn't some secret phrase that Jefferson made up. It was the idea, that quest for 
how did Kennedy put it, using your talents to the best of their abilities, but it's also for self-mastery and that only comes with age. So, you know, that's why the, the Senate was um, supposed to be the wiser elders. And I suppose our first presidents were old enough by the standards of those days. Um, what they would have made of the age of antibiotics when people are living <laughs> until their 80s uh, is uh, another matter. So, Well, you have a, a part where you talk about Franklin's epitaph and that he writes uh, sort of more perfect, that he, he thinks that when he looks back over his life, I'm paraphrasing here, that life is almost like a manuscript that you could revise to be more perfect. And that reminded me, you, have, um, you, know, you, you run the National Constitution Center, and that's, of course, in the preamble. And do you think there was a connection for Franklin between you know, thinking of life as something that he wished he could revise and make more perfect and the way he thought about the country? Well, it's, it's a wonderful metaphor, isn't it? A printer's error, so appropriate from a printer. And the fact that f he attributes whatever success he's achieved in, he achieved in life to his conciliating temperament. Think of it, the most famous man in the world, acclaimed with Voltaire as someone who's tamed the heavens and has brought the, and, and the Gulf Stream and, and uh, the, great, the great Franklin. But he says it's his conciliating temper and the fact that he learned not to assert his opinions to forcefully, but to say, it occurs to me, or it may be so, or I think perhaps this. And it's his conciliating temper that allows him to be such a conciliating force at the Constitutional Convention and to inspire compromise. So it must uh, come from that background. Yeah, I, you, at the end, um, you have a very handy list of like, if you want to read these people, good additions. I, I almost wish you'd had a like top 10 advice from the founders based on the classical period. Because I started keeping a little list, and that was one of them, like, try and be more conciliatory. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Frank, Franklin has those little uh, legends, res resolve to do what you ought and do what you resolve, uh, or Jefferson's you know, for silence, if angry, count to 10, if very angry, 100. It's definitely... Yeah, that might have been the smartest thing Jefferson totally, ever said. Totally, it's yeah. such a good idea. <laughs> Just wait before you tweet. Is a very... Yeah, yeah, wait before you tweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. founder of X ought to, yeah, like, think about totally. that. Yeah, you could, maybe he'll read your book. That and, would be uh, great. And I, I mean, I am struck so much by, not that human nature has changed, but that, that this was a, a world which, when they thought about the past. They thought that there were people in the past who had also shared the struggles. And you could look to them for guidance and for wisdom. And there's, I think, something very appealing about um, that aspect. And, and you say in this book, you are an English major. And I was an English major. And yet English majors yes. get, get right. And liberal arts, in some ways, this is a book that really resonates with the importance of liberal arts and with the centrality of, a, of the liberal arts tradition in terms of how our system of government is sort of based on. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I'm so honored to be here in Boston and to talk about the great teachers who inspired in me this conviction that the liberal arts are necessary for learning how to live. In addition to Sack Van Berkovich, I studied English with the great Walter Jackson Bate who was a great humanist, uh, who wrote the great biography of Samuel Johnson of his time, which I recommend, and taught this wonderful course on the age of Johnson, which taught the 18th century prose, which was so balanced. The greatest flights of the human imagination are not from pleasure to pleasure, but from hope to hope. You just hear the musicality of it. He wrote a great book called Criticism, the major text, which collects classical Greek and Enlightenment literary theory. And it's all just the big essays, which even then we didn't read as much uh, from uh, all, all the main uh, people. And all were jumping off of Homer's idea of the purpose of humanities are to instruct and delight, to teach us how to live, but in a pleasing or beautiful or harmonious or amusing way that will draw us in. And the the, the overwhelming 
urge to figure out what can be put to use, which was Samuel Johnson's phrase, suffuses all of this Enlightenment moral philosophy channeling the classics. How do we live? What are the slogans? What do we do when we get up? How, what, what, what's the way, not just, not, not just to be like Jesus and Socrates, as, as, as Franklin said, but like us as human beings, how can we just use our talents to the best of our ability? And that's why I'm so um, uh, resolved to be a crusader for the radically self-empowering act of deep reading. I mean, that's just what the project did for me. It's kind of reacquainted me with the joys and meaning of, of daily reading and stuff that's not directly related to what I have to do for my job. And it's stuff that all of us have within our control. The, the texts are all online. We the, the political system is more polarized than ever. We're extraordinarily challenging, serious times for the world. There's so many... Uh, things that we can't control, but we do have the capacity to control our own uh, reading and, and self-improvement. And, and I'm really a crusader also, and I think from, I got this in college too, of the really uh, empowering nature of primary texts, going back to the texts themselves, not the way other people read them or the debates over them, but just, and, and it's all online, it's so exciting. So. That's what we're doing at the Constitution Center, is trying to inspire uh, kids and learners of all ages to uh, do deep reading of the primary text. We're putting many of them online as part of a new founder's library selected by liberal and conservative historians. We've got free Constitution 101 classes about the core principles of the Constitution and Declaration. A new partnership with Khan Academy to bring all this online on their great platform. So hopefully we're going to reach hundreds of thousands of kids when we launch next year. And I'm just inviting all of you. You're obviously readers because you've come to this beautiful place uh, to, to, uh, for this conversation. Join in the radical, empowering act of daily reading. And let's be as perfect as we can be. Yeah, it's, it's just a, a wonderful book and um, chock filled with anecdotes and interesting stories. And also, um, as I say, it's going to make everyone want to read just not more about the founders, but more about a number of the classical writers. And we're going to move to questions in a minute. And while um, people can think of their question, that's a sign, think of a question, OK? Uh, there's microphones uh, here for to ask. I'm going to ask um, you one last question. If you could only take one of the classical writers you read, to a desert island, which one would it be? You get one book, not your Kindle. Huh. <laughs> one of my favorite uh, shows is the BBC's Desert Island Discs. It started in the 50s, you know, and, and just everyone from the 50s on uh, is given their favorite music, and that's the question at the end. What book do you want? No Bible and Shakespeare is the always thing. Um, can I have enlightenment? Folks? No, you get one one person. It's got to be classic. Cla cla yeah, it can't classical. Going to go with the hard yeah. stuff. Um, Going to go with the hard stuff. Because I, I wanted some poetry, like Alexander Pope or something. Yeah, no, I know. Pleasing, I know you'd like Alexander yeah. Pope. And I can't. I don't. <laughs> I I and I don't guess. read. I don't read I, Homer I, in the originals. So I, I, I could have guessed that. Hand I mean, look. I, I, the most practical of the bunch is the most accessible is Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. So I take him. Yeah, you take Marcus Aurelius yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah, I loved the fact that um, on, on Jefferson's list, Jefferson was not a big fan of educating women, or not a big fan about that. But on his reading list, the two of those books were translated by women, one by Elizabeth yes. Carter and one by Sarah Fielding. So women were influencing him, even if he was not giving them uh, due credit. And your next book on Catherine McCauley will show how great her influence was. Yeah, yeah, on, very on interesting. Yeah. Well, people. let's um, let's uh, take some questions from the audience, and um, and hopefully you stand right up there, and you can ask a question uh, at the mic. And everyone's going to look a little bit like God, so huh. um, <laughs> because you're backlit beautifully by the lights. So first, thank you very much wonderful and enlightening presentation. I must say, though, it's incredibly depressing to listen to you talk about all these wonderful founders, flaws in all, granted, but people who are trying to be self-aware to pursue that happiness that they then tried to impart on all of us. So the question I have is, where today 
in our current political system, do you look for hope mm. that our lives in the future will in some ways reflect all of the wonderful thoughts and aspirations of our founding fathers? It's, a, it's an important question. Um, uh, one thing that's so inspiring about the founders and so much of American history is what, what deep readers all of them were. And they so thoughtfully and, and beautifully expressed their clash of ideas. We do have readers uh, today in our uh, political system and the standard of political discourse when you get past the X's and the tweets and, and so forth um, it, it may be higher than we know. But the place that I look for hope is in the incredible conversations and classes that I have the unbelievable privilege of moderating at the Constitution Center. So what an extraordinary job this is. Every week on the podcast, I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative scholars in the country for a thoughtful debate about the constitutional issues in the news. Just last week, we did the Section 3 case, the Supreme Court's Trump v. Anderson case. Michael McConnell and Mark Graber, the leading liberal and conservative historians on this question, ended up agreeing about a substantial part of why they thought the court was wrong. They disagreed respectfully, and the whole discussion was civil. And that's what happens every week. These are serious people who disagree strongly, but have civil dialogue. And then there are these amazing classes. Imagine convening on Zoom classes from California and Ohio and debating constitutional issues and having the kid trade, kids trade ideas, always thoughtful, always civil. It's just extraordinary. And all it takes is is time. You have to create platforms where people have the time to actually deliberate and have the license to listen thoughtfully to arguments on both sides before making up their own mind. So I am hopeful, actually, that if we can just uh, do exactly what we're doing, which is to create these enclaves of reason, that there may be some hope for salvation. Well, and, you, and you've done such a great job at the Constitution Center in really um, speaking to school kids about that. And I know the JFK Library yes. uh, has now, post-COVID, has kids back. And I know in Massachusetts, a big tradition here, you may not know this, is uh, to come down and be in the Senate, right? Um, there's a little model Senate. And I know my, um, my kids all did that. And they came away a little bit like, I maybe someday I want to run for office, you know, because mm. I think, and I do think that educational role that institutions like these play is so important. Um, not sure everyone's going to read Plutarch's Lives, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but hopefully along the way, yeah. Any, any kind of deep reading is good. Yeah, another question we have. Thank you for joining us. I actually have two questions for you. Um, I am the representative for your online group. Oh, so great. Um, I don't think Benjamin Franklin included patience in his 12 virtues. Can you shed some light on why? Mm. How has the pursuit of happiness changed in the major changes of our country? Emancipation Proclamation, Industrial Revolution, becoming a major political player on the international stage, et cetera. Two great questions. I think patience was definitely within the spirit of the classical virtues, which were, after all, prudence, temperance, courage, and justice. And Franklin talks about tranquility and um, moderation and so forth. And he was kind of just trying to approximate what he was reading in uh, Pythagoras. And, and silence also encompasses that idea of waiting. So you're absolutely right uh, to note the importance of patience. But I, I think he, he may have tried to get it using other phrases. Such a really important question about the evolution of the idea of the pursuit of happiness. Uh, from the Emancipation Proclamation to the Industrial Revolution to today. What I found so striking is that the classical definition, which we heard President Kennedy use, persist, and it's such an, it's such an apt quote, because whatever, that was the early 60s. It's persisting all the way up. So it starts in the founding era. Then Quincy Adams applies it to abolitionism. Frederick Douglass, we haven't talked about and should, because he's so central defines self-reliance as the pursuit of happiness through education and self-perfection. Tocqueville, in the 19th century, his famous definition of self-interest properly understood is his definition of the pursuit of happiness, is resisting your immediate impulses for your long-term goals. 
and, and it persists throughout the Industrial Revolution. In the spirit of capitalism, Weber says that that kind of self-discipline and the Puritan work ethic is crucial to the uh, success of capitalism. And then we come into the modern era and Eleanor Roosevelt is still using it. I did a great event at the Roosevelt House in New York last week and Harold Holzer, the wonderful um, head of there, found Eleanor Roosevelt describing the pursuit of happiness as industrious self-mastery so you can be a useful citizen. The question is why? And this is the question, why did it drop out in the 60s? And I do not have a confident answer to that, but here are some possibilities. David Brooks, uh, who's been writing great stuff about character, blames Freud and the substitution of personality for character. George Will, at a book event we did a few weeks ago, blamed the Romantic era of the 19th century and Goethe and <laughs> let it all hang out and autonomy versus whatever it is, sincerity, authenticity versus sincerity. Um, James Davidson Hunter has blamed post-structuralism and the decline of faith in the individual or liberal ideal. But I'm interested, and this is just a thought, when I was in college, Daniel Bell wrote this great book on the cultural contradictions of capitalism, where he said capitalism both relies on self-restraint, but has to create a consumer culture to create a market for its goods, and therefore encourages the kind of reckless consumerism that the production of the goods wants to deny. I then heard a really interesting talk uh, at UVA from a guy recently who said, the internet has made it so much worse, and by creating filter bubbles and echo chambers and algorithmic ra r rabbit holes, the whole system is designed to turn us from citizens into consumers who are constantly demanding the immediate gratification of our most ego-based desires. So there's, uh, there's something in that too. But whatever the actual cause of it, once pop culture began to exalt immediate gratification over self-denial, then game, out, game over. Yeah, great, yeah. great question. An another question. <clears throat> Welcome back to Boston. Thank you. My grandfather, Joe Plank, was one of those people who had that kind of classical education and became a public, very prominent public figure um, as a lawyer, advisor to judges, and so on and so forth. And he had me reading Cicero growing up <laughs> in Michigan, okay? Wonderful. So, you know, I, I just love what you're doing, and I have an old engraving print of Pythagoras on my, it's, it's kind of water damaged, but I have that on my wall. So, wow. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot here. What, what's he doing in the print? What's the picture of? He's just, it's a, it's a portrait of his. Yeah. It's a portrait of so his. Great. that Grandpa had found in an old bookstore in Philadelphia somewhere. Um, my question has to do with how we sort of not only cultivate those habits of the heart and mind that speak to virtue and civic virtue in particular, but how we export them or embed them or integrate them into our institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, I've spent the last four decades looking at this money and morality continuum and taught courses on that at Harvard Divinity School. Um, I was honored to be able to write the preamble for Watertown, Massachusetts, new, new city charter. Mm. And Watertown and Boston are both celebrating their 400th birthday in 2030. The challenge, I think, that is before us is, is not only to cultivate those habits of heart and mind through reading and you know, really diving deeply into these historical figures and making it real as you've done in your wonderful book, uh, but also to think about not just how we use our reason, but how we use our imagination mm. to change the existing structures we have or come up with new ones. And one of the things that I'm working on with um, officials in Watertown and Boston, and I'm trying to build this demonstration project in, Lans in Michigan and Massachusetts, that looks at what a civic fiduciary is made real and how we build equity culture. This gets to the preamble again, because I think preambles, which you know the US Constitution is based on what we had here in Massachusetts. And Franklin was influenced by the Iroquois Confederation as well as you know the, the classicists. How can we take this, this 
disregarded important statement that often precedes charters or constitutions, preambles, which is a statement of public virtue and value. How can we make them real and assure that they have teeth? And how can we cultivate among the general public the capacity to do civic moral reasoning in addition to thinking about the policies that we make? That's the educational task in real time that I hope we all can start joining in and, and do more of in, in these very broken, impoverished times, as Michael Sandel would say. Mm. Beautifully said, and thank you for your important work in inspiring this kind of civic practice. Uh, how to lead a movement for the revival of these values is something that the Constitution Center is thinking a lot about, because this is our mission, is to uh, educate the public about the Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Surprisingly, there's a division uh, not surprisingly, there's, they're, they're, everything is polarized, and there's a division uh, about how to teach civics, and some uh, want to teach the civic virtues by actively teaching virtue, and the neo-Augustinian strain of conservatism says that there's one truth and people should be moved to embrace the revealed truth. That's not consistent with the liberal tradition, and therefore is not the best way to do it, I think. Um, the founders thought that the way to teach civic virtue, and particularly had to teach two things. First, the substantive knowledge of liberty, because unless people knew what liberty was, they wouldn't defend it. And second, the habits of deliberation, how to disagree without being disagreeable. That's why George Washington wanted to create a national university that would bring people from different states to set aside their sectional differences so they could converge around constitutional principles and, and learn the habits. And that's why so much of what we're doing at the NCC is just modeling the dialogue. Mary, you've participated in these discussions, bringing together liberal and conservative historians, having the podcast, showing people that it's possible to have thoughtful agreement and disagreement is so incredibly meaningful so that people will model it in their own lives. So I don't have a question, but I think it's important sometimes for people in your position to know how it affects ordinary people. So I am a retired nurse practitioner, but I have a passion for history. So as soon as the Edward M. Kennedy Institute opened, I became a volunteer and the experience for, for people coming in. And unfortunately, it shut down in 2020 and they haven't brought us back. But I learned so much. And my expertise is on the first three women senators that you've never heard of. And in my retirement, I work for a company called Senior U, and we go to libraries and Council of Aging's and give, we're not playing mahjong, <laughs> we're not knitting, we're learning things, and I give these talks. But in COVID, I found the Constitution Center, and it has become so important in my life. So much so that I have three grandchildren now, 13, 10, and five, and they get a book from me. And my granddaughter says, who am I going to read about this time, Grandma? <laughs> because I'm always looking for them to understand history. And I'm a child of Disney, so Johnny Tremaine was just one of my favorite stories. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to my 10-year-old grandson. And it's written in some of the old English, so we're reading that together. And I have friends coming to my house to hear one of your talks. Um, and I just want you to know that it's real, what you do out there, it, it trickles down. And as a nurse practitioner, when I meet somebody at AAA who says, oh, Miss Bishop, do you remember me? <laughs> and it just means so much. And I just wanted to let you know mm -hmm. it's an integral part of my life. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's so beautiful. I appreciate that so much. And Thank you so much for sharing with your kids and your grandkids this love of history. That's so, it's so meaningful. You know that you're, you're transforming their lives by sharing those stories. I'm so glad the NCC resources are meaningful. And, and I, I, I feel that these, I, I encounter people from across the country who are having similar experiences. And I'll think, look at all these wonderful lifelong learners who are coming out, because you 
because history is important to your lives and it's fulfilling. And we also know that it, I, you feel like you're using your talents better when you're learning and growing rather than browsing and surfing. So I'm so grateful to you and I'll always remember what you said. Thank you so much. And, and I would just say, this is a great thing about your book, is your books really models all sorts of people from this generation who throughout their whole lives felt like they were supposed to keep learning. They didn't think you learned it when you were young. They were, you know, particularly John Quincy Adams and Adams, who late in their lives are going back and rereading and visiting these things again. Ken Burns's definition of eudaimonia, or the classical uh, definition, is being a lifelong learner. And maybe, you know, whether or not old people make the best politicians, the glory of aging, according to the classical wisdom, is that's the time when you can begin to focus on your lifelong learning. And rather than just working for breadwinning, to use your golden years to learn and grow. And it's such a privilege, and it's so inspiring because as long as we have our faculties, all of us can do it. Yeah, but we have another question. We have another two. <laughs> um, so from our online audience. Okay, read one at a time and then we'll have Jeff Perfect. read them that way. Sonnets. <laughs> During COVID, were you watching Sir Patrick Stewart read a Shakespearean sonnet every day? I did not. I've heard him read other stuff, but um, I look forward to checking out his sonnets. He has a very beautiful voice, and I'm sure he reads them very wonderfully. Was the pursuit of happiness called out for by the Founding Fathers simply a goal to something that can never be fully achieved? A absolutely. The, the, the goal and quest is in the pursuit, not in the obtaining. By definition, we will never be perfect. Only Jesus and Socrates and Pythagoras and a handful of sages can begin to achieve that kind of perfection, but with full recognition and full humility of our inability to reach the final destination, the joy is in the pursuit. We have more if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How has social media affected the pursuit of happiness for American citizens? What about citizens of the world? All of the evidence, increasingly familiar, shows that social media use increases depression, isolation, anger, all the unproductive emotions that the ancient wisdom tells us to moderate. Social media companies burst out of the scene around 2010, and all of those factors began to increase dramatically. Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff uh, show all that. And then there's the effect on our politics. And you know, I talked about the difference between Madison's vision of thoughtful citizens in coffee houses reading complicated Federalist papers and the world of X. But it's so striking that all of the factors that the social media platforms reward, which are anger, immediate gratification, polarization, are the opposite of what the founders aspired to. The, that, that's why the simplest and the, the, the simplest life hack is just to turn the darn devices off for at least a little bit every day so that we can do deep reading instead of surfing. Or, or to download for free from your local library one of these great books. I mean, and every time you do it, open up, you know, Tusculan, you know? <laughs> or, or, I mean, it's just amazing that the actual books that Adams read, his, his copy of Priestly on. The, on, on Hinduism, Massachusetts Historical put it online, at Google Books digitized it. You could see Adams's marginal notes. It's just mind-blowing. And think of how hard they had to fight for access to books. And Frederick Douglass, oh, just, I, I was in New Haven uh, last week, and David Blight, the great biographer of Frederick Douglass, brought out a copy of the Columbian Orator, a first edition, which was the book that inspired Douglass. And Douglass had to buy this book on the streets of Baltimore with bread, and he also had to use his bread to pay the boys on the street to teach him how to read, because his wicked master had forbade his learning how to read, because that would make him want to be free. And you think of what Douglas did to learn how to read, to get the book, which totally transformed his life and resolved him to become a freedom fighter. All we've got to do is press 
the button and click. Yeah, yeah. No, you can read your way through the whole Boston Public Library, uh, John Quincy, John Adams Library online. So there's a good thing about the online world, just maybe not the X part of the social media a part. Absolutely. Yeah, it does bring another another question here. Yeah, do you think the falling off of the pursuit of happiness is maybe because people are turning towards other philosophical schools of thought like nihilism or maybe on the flip side existentialism or or potentially could it be that they're seeking pleasure and not following like stoic beliefs where they have that um, discipline to, to do that learning? Yes, that you put it so well. I and mean, those are great philosophical challenges to the ancient wisdom. Nihilism and existentialism are two uh, versions that reject the classical learning or, or just turning to immediate uh, pleasure seeking, which of course everyone has always done through history because it's very gratifying. And without a kind of cu cultural framework and also a spiritual framework, it's harder to resurrect this ancient stuff. It, you know, obviously my reading project was unusual and weird and, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 there is a degree to which, when you're getting it outside of a spiritual tradition, which I am, and and many do, you have to kind of find it on your own. But it's also striking that a lot of the modern mindfulness approaches do channel the ancient wisdom and the um, uh, wisdom of emotional intelligence and cognitive behavior therapy is based on the Stoics and confirms the ancient wisdom. Eastern mindfulness teaching centers on focusing the only thing you can control, which is your own thoughts. And much of happiness literature and the whole psychology of happiness confirms what the ancients knew, which is that happiness is in relationships and doing for others and in um, being our best selves. Well, and I think one of the things that a lot of reading the classical writers did for this group of people also is those people lived in terrible times. And they lived through terrible times. And, and strangely, I wonder if there wasn't something slightly reassuring to people that other people had survived terrible times and, and there were sort of habits of mind to help you through that. I mean, Stoicism arose during a time of plague. Aurelius wrote during the Great Plague to console ourselves against what we can't control. And the terrible plagues of the founding and their smallpox epidemics and the wars and the fact that their kids were dying so young and the politics were in danger of collapse and there was tyranny everywhere made this wisdom so necessary. It's been the fate of humanity through from the beginning. During COVID, apparently there was a renewal of interest in stoicism. And I think I just came to it literally by coincidence or accident, I wasn't seeking it out but it is a very consoling philosophy for challenging times. We're gonna take one last question from our um, Zoom audience, uh, and, then, and then we'll wrap up. Is Jeffrey Rosen familiar with the early 1990s book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? <laughs> <laughs> this was a key book in my own development of a positive habit of mind. Wonderful, I, I am, uh, although not closely, you, you've inspired me to re-read it, and it's, I, I believe without knowing, check it out, uh, let's figure out who Stephen Covey's influences were, and it may have been that there were some Stoic uh, predecessors. Dale Carnegie's Habits of Highly Effective People did rely on Stoicism and on Franklin, and just there's a really unbroken line of the great self-help literature that often goes back to the beginning. Well, I, I want to end with one sonnet that you wrote while reading uh, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. And this ends, uh, do the work with patience and industry. Find fulfillment in what you're doing now, free from fear or hope of publicity. But I think your book deserves a lot of publicity. <laughs> and uh, and I'm an really glad the <laughs> that the fear, not so much, but I, but I hope that your book gets a lot of publicity. Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight, Jeff Rosen. I want to thank the JFK Library and the audience here and um, watching us from home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>